It's early evening in November on a quiet village road. A driver in a Renault Laguna and another in a Ford Escort are rapidly approaching the point where their lives will become inextricably linked. It's a reconstruction of one of the two and a half thousand serious accidents that blight Britain's roads every month. The escort driver is seriously injured, the Renault driver is unhurt but shocked, and it looks like the escort driver was at fault, pulling out of the junction and not seeing the Renault until it was too late. But what actually happened? Who was to blame? And how do you find out what went on without seeing the actual impact? It's a job for police detectives, accident investigators and forensic scientists. And we've assembled a team to show us some of the latest techniques used to piece together the evidence. This real life CSI job starts with precise measurement. And the latest electronic devices are quicker and more accurate, so there's less time with the road closed. This Leica measuring station uses lasers and GPS to pinpoint the exact position of the crashed cars and the data is quickly converted into a plan of the accident. This 3D version is even more comprehensive producing a millimeter accurate representation of the crash scene in minutes which you can zoom into and view from different angles. Rather than having to decide at the scene which details are important, you can call up the file to measure anything that becomes significant as the investigations progress. Measurement complete, the first thing to do is to identify the point of impact. It's obviously in front of this trail of glass and debris because that goes forward in an impact, not backwards. And at the moment it's looking as though it's somewhere around this junction here. And the escort's providing all the clues. It's left a series of marks which investigators like Dominic Disbury can use to determine what happened after it was hit. Glass, gouges in the tarmac, fluid trails and skid marks. You can probably see that there are marks across the grass and the mud here, so that's useful in that it shows exactly how that vehicle moved and that can be used in later calculations to, to work out the, the, the speed of this vehicle and the vehicle which struck it. Different tyre marks tell different stories and the traffic accident investigation manual is full of diagrams that let you decide if a car was on the limit of adhesion from hard cornering or skidding under hard braking, although with anti-lock brakes such marks are increasingly rare. In this case, the absence of evidence at one point is particularly telling. Interestingly, the escort left no skid marks at the junction, which could mean that it had ABS, which leaves no marks, but we know this escort doesn't, so that implies the driver didn't break. Maybe they didn't see the Laguna. Maybe they were asleep. A surprisingly large proportion of car forensic work involves the analysis of bulbs. They behave very differently in a crash, depending on whether they're on or not. When they're off, the tungsten in the filament is cold and brittle, and in a crash it tends to break. When they're on, the filament's obviously much hotter and it tends to bend or distort. You can't necessarily tell just by looking at them in the field, so you have to take them back to the lab and look at them under a microscope. Headlamp filaments reach 3000 degrees centigrade, and if they're on during an accident, they oxidize and fuse with the shattered particles of glass to give these characteristic globules. In this case, the analysis will show that although the escort's headlights were on, the brake lights weren't, which suggests that the driver remained unaware of the approaching Laguna right up to the point of impact. This would trigger further investigations. Is there evidence of drugs or alcohol? Was he on the phone? Or is there, as seemed likely in this case, anything in the driver's medical records to suggest that he was likely to be asleep at the wheel? Fatal car crashes are now being investigated by the police with the same rigour as murder investigations. And penalties for dangerous and careless driving are increasing. So finding out who was to blame in a crash like this is vitally important. And we're finding out how modern investigation techniques and forensic evidence can help piece together what really happened. So far we've established that the driver of the escort could have been asleep when they emerged from a rural village junction into the path of this Laguna. But what was the driver of the Laguna doing? 
Well, apart from the evidence at the scene, there's a lot of other information that can be discovered to help build up a picture of what led up to it. And one area that plays an increasing role in modern accident investigation is the CCTV camera. They're everywhere, and in this case, cameras in a nearby village had observed the Laguna traveling well over the speed limit a short while before the crash. But what was the Laguna doing at the moment of impact? Crush depth, the amount by which a car deforms on impact, can be the best indicator of how fast a car was going, and it's getting more accurate as databases improve. The cars will probably have been tested by NCAP, plus there's data from other tests, which help produce indexes relating depth to speed for different models. Unfortunately, in this case, the Laguna hit the rear of the Escort, and there's not enough information available to calculate its speed. So how can we find out how fast it was going? Well, surprisingly, the Escort can tell us. We know where it ended up, we know where it was hit, and there's published data which tells us how quickly cars decelerate when they're sliding across tarmac and, indeed, ploughed fields. And we can use it to find out how fast the Laguna needed to be travelling to send the Escort this far. Calculations suggested about 50 miles an hour. But those estimates can be tested further in a computer reconstruction, like this one by experts at the University of Bolton. Vary speeds and angles of impact to see which fits the damage best. This is the sort of thing that can then be presented to a court to help illustrate the sequence of events. One new development which could remove the need to estimate speed is the black box recorder. They're now being fitted to an increasing number of cars. And before our crash, we had the Renault fitted with a Siemens VDO black box, the same type that's installed in police cars. It measures speed, acceleration and deceleration, both forwards and backwards and side to side, and it monitors things like whether your lights, wipers and indicators are on or not. When a significant event like a crash occurs, it takes information from 30 seconds before the event and 15 seconds afterwards and dumps it into one of its many memories. It can be downloaded and analysed on site or taken back somewhere else for further analysis. The black box revealed that the Laguna was travelling at nearly 60 miles an hour in the 30 limit. But one thing the black box can't tell you is who was driving. Often the person who was driving at the time of the accident, particularly if they think they're over the drink drive limit, will try and claim that one of their passengers was behind the wheel. Before the crash, we placed a dummy in the back seat of the Laguna. It was covered in chalk to represent the hair and clothing fibres which will often be left behind on a seat in a crash. By examining this trace evidence, you can pin down exactly who was sitting where. So, the latest forensic and investigative techniques have taken us from a confusing aftermath to a clearer understanding of what actually happened. As to how to apportion blame, well, that's for the courts to decide. <laughs>